following on from my previous video. For many Rhodesians it is uncomfortable to think that among us were sellouts. Sadly, that's a fact of any war. With my conclusion that it was near impossible to shoot down a Viscount with a Strela, it's logical to provide another solution to explain the explosions. I for one, don't call this creating conspiracy theories. Conspiracy theories are based on wishful thinking. Had a missile hit an outer turbine there would be no book called The Uncomfortable Truth. Nor would there be if a full air crash investigation report was published. Nor would there be a book if utter rubbish claims, like the missile going up the exhaust vent and exploding on the low-pressure turbines wasn't made. There were other reports, like a bag of used missile batteries being found from failed attempts to shoot down passenger aircraft at Victoria Falls. The Strela battery is not like a AAA type battery, it gets extremely hot from the chemical reaction. Only two batteries are issued with each missile. So if four were found it meant that two missiles could not be launched. Later terrorists in the Middle East wars tried to connect up all sorts of batteries, as getting the timing right to fire the missile was such a problem. A declassified report to NATO found that some innovative batteries were being tried. These ranged from car batteries to motorcycle batteries. Most of these attempts met with failure. Another attempt makes note that the lock-on failed, resulting a failed launch. This highlights one of the many additional problems facing the shooter. It reveals the Strela or Manpad system as they are now called, in its true form, the reports reads an I quote. Limitations to the use of improvised batteries for first-generation ANPAD systems. Only minority of the reported attempts were successful against slow aerial platforms, like helicopters, all of them using power, apparently from external batteries for vehicles. If there were any other successful targeting with manpads, it would always be widely exposed to public knowledge. To shoot first-generation manpad system, the limitations faced are Need of an appropriate grip stock the system does not offer a very high effectiveness, even against helicopters or transport airplanes. Limitations in directional attack, altitude, speed of target vulnerability to countermeasures. Lack of adequate training, no good instructors, no previous shooting, no tactical training. Evaluation of aging missiles functionally requires technical skills and knowledge. Bad storage conditions and no maintenance affecting all components of the systems. Sometimes, the energy would be only enough for propellant charge but not to power the seeker. After analyzing the information collected and once the videos are carefully watched, the real targeting success seems not to always be as evidence. Moving on from the battery issues, I looked at the maintenance problem. The Strela manual says the missile system needs to be serviced and checked monthly, it was not a system you could knock and bash around in the bush. While the AK-47 could be very badly handled and still fire, the Strela was not of the same design. Storage-like maintenance was a problem. Here are some pictures from a storage unit or armory in Africa. We knew that arms were very poorly stored and maintained in the terrorist camps, and these pictures provide the evidence. Returning to the possible locations for placing a bomb in the sabotage theory, the Viscount offered multiple places to easily stow a time device. The wheel bay was the most obvious location. It was also a location where multiple key targets were located if one was contemplating sabotage. The main fuel lines ran though the bay, the hydraulic system ran through it. It was next to a main wiring harness and the main fuel tanks. Finally the main wing strut ran at the rear of the bay, to which the wheel assembly was attached. While this all applied to the first Viscount incident, the second incident was different. This was of course after the SPAR testing, so if another attempt was made it had to ensure that it was successful. So, the location was moved to target the engine mounting locations. To reach these, the easiest route was through the air intake of the heat exchanger, which was located adjacent to the firewall and mounting brackets and bolts. We can see clearly in the color diagram, that the engine diagonal and lower strut was targeted. These are highlighted in yellow. A similar structure is duplicated on the inner turbine mounting. The effect of an explosion here would be to blow off the engine or turbine mounting, which would in turn twist the spinning propellers with engine, either into the cabin or into the other engine or turbine. Both catastrophic events. Given that Hollingworth claimed in his forensic report, that the one engine was not found supports this assumption. It would have been shredded by the other engine's propeller blades. Hollingworth then goes on to explain another assumption. Here, he claims the Strela hit the low-pressure turbine blades. Well this is not possible. 
He based this on finding pieces of shrapnel found in the low-pressure turbine blades. These pieces of shrapnel would have come from an explosion placed in the heat exchanger intake, just inches away and not from Estrela doing the impossible and traveling up the exhaust vent. After providing reasonable and plausible locations, and sites for placing and exploding the devices, it was time to look at the abilities of the seeker to see the aircraft. Peter Petterboyer made note in his book, The Winds of Destruction, that static testing, had shown that in some instances the whole airframe was visible to the Strela homing eye. I had found numerous scientific articles that were subsequently written that explained this finding. From the diagram we can see six sources of heat signatures, these are, aircraft hot parts like, 1, the exhaust, exhaust flume, and tailpipe. Then 2, aircraft plume emissions like hot CO2 and water vapor, then 3, heated skin parts like the exhaust pipes and skin. 4, reflected sunshine from the sky, 5, reflected solar radiation from the canopy and skin. 6, reflected radiation from the earth. Each of the six identified areas has a specific range of emissions. Let's look at these. 1. The emission parts, the IR range here is 1 to 4 angstroms. This is for an engine that vents back out into open air, however the Viscount vents exhaust gases down at steel-lined exhaust tube at least 5 feet long. So the emission is more likely to be in the 4 and above range. To confirm this we have to compare the heat chart from the DART manual to the heat chart of a jet turbine or engine. This shows that at the fan face, that the temperature is 510 degrees Celsius. This quickly reduces as the exhaust gases travel down the pipe. And at exiting is between the 510 degrees of the fan face and 316 degrees Celsius as shown by the chart. Both these temperatures are not visible to the Strela homing eye. As previously mentioned, the peak sensitivity of a typical uncooled lead sulfide detector lies in the 2 to 3 angstrom range. According to Veen's displacement law, the temperature range of the radiator with the corresponding peak energy emission wavelength of the 2 to 3 angstrom range is 966 to 1449 Kelvin, or 690 to 1200 degrees, in Celsius. This temperature range covers the typical temperature values of jet engine turbines, justifying the suitability of lead sulfide or sulfanilidine lead detectors for homing in on the hot tailpipes of jet aircraft. The other areas of emission will now be covered, but if the main source of heat emission was not in the heat seekers 1 to 3 angstrom range, we could discount the exhaust flume. This left only sun strike from the skin and reflected emissions. The day of the first Viscount tragedy was overcast as a layer of alto cumulus was present. This high cloud cover is evident in holiday photographs and was also present on the second day, as seen on site photographs. However using an online sun strike calculator, we can see that the sun would have been directly behind the aircraft and in line with its flight direction. This limits the sun strike quite considerably. The angle is also relatively low to the horizon. This rules out the emissions from sun strike and also skin reflected emissions. The low TRAN code that calculates the atmospheric IR transmissivity in the background IR radiance was released by the USA Air Force Geophysical Laboratory, in the 1970s. It is a comprehensive empirical-based program, based on band models of molecular absorption, with low spectral resolution. It considers spatial and temporal changes in atmospheric properties, and their effect on IR transmission. The graph shows the atmospheric transmissivity for the 1 to 20 angstrom band obtained using the LOTRAN code. As seen from the graph there are several atmospheric windows, some of which are too narrow and insignificant, namely the 1 to 4 band, with the 8 to 14 angstrom range being the widest. Also, atmospheric transmissivity beyond 14 angstrom range is negligible, hence, cannot be harnessed for aircraft detection. What the LOTRAN model proved was that atmospheric conditions had to be just right, to enable the seeker head to lock on. It also shows the need for an improvised seeker head, that could see and detect in the 4 to 8 angstrom band, which is seen on later generation ground-to-air missiles. I ruled out the atmospheric conditions as being any adverse factor in the performance of the Strela's homing ability, other than sun strike, which was not a factor due to the azimuth bearing of the sun at the times of day the events occurred. We can confirm this, as had fuselage sun strike or emissions played a role, we would have seen the missiles hitting the fuselage, rather than the inner engine locations. We now needed to look at another factor which was the shrapnel pattern. 
I knew from other photographs, that the Strela exploded with a definitive pattern. This is evidenced by the photograph of an A-10 Groundhog aircraft where a Strela hit the exhaust of the starboard engine. Hollingworth's forensic report notes that shrapnel had hit the outer engine or turbine nacelle. It had certainly hit what he describes as the area of the exhaust outlet, and that shrapnel had hit the wheel rim. For this to happen, it would mean that the wheel bay and the area between the two engines would be hit with shrapnel as it expanded out. I looked at the few photographs, that I had of this area of the wing and found no signs of shrapnel. So what this meant was that another type of device was used. Was it just a slab of TNT or explosive, or was it a smaller device like a hand grenade? One has to be reminded, that the, the concussive forces caused in some instances more damage than the shrapnel. The Rhodesian Gulf bomb was a classic example of this use. We also know that the Strela explosive head was approximately twice the size of a normal fragmentation grenade. Further simulation testing also pointed to a device other than a Strela. In the modeling a hand grenade and a Strela warhead were used for comparison purposes. The conclusion was that the lack of shrapnel damage on the wing between the two engine mounts was evidence that the explosion was probably not caused by a Strela. It was time to deal with the so-called identifiable pieces of shrapnel, the ones Hollingworth said belonged to the Strela, and which were found by Captain Downs when he returned to the site some two or three weeks later. And of course after the SPAR testing at Encomo Barracks. I am not sure why the Department of Civil Aviation, who were supposedly in charge of the investigation, would send an Air Rhodesia Airways pilot to look for more pieces, who incidentally claimed vigorously in a letter to me that and I quote, I was never part of the official investigation, unquote. Hollingworth and Downs described these pieces coming from the wheel hub, which was still in the wheel bay. As we can see this whole area was subject to vigorous burning and extreme heat, sufficient to melt aluminium. This we can see in the photograph. Then Hollingworth says in his forensic report that a piece or pieces came from the ceiling ring below the warhead. As I mentioned in part 1 of the video, there is no ceiling ring in this position, and we can see that from the photographs. The ceiling ring is below the winglet guidance controls and gas accumulator. The only way known parts could get on site would be if they were planted there, either from the Victoria Falls incident or the SPAR testing. This supposition adds to the theory, that the Viscounts were probably sabotaged. Secondly anyone, and I repeat anyone who was involved in an air crash of this magnitude would take photographs, and I am certain that cameras were taken by most senior investigators to the site. This would be the case for the return trip to identify and verify the location of the finds. This aspect is conspicuous for its absence. So where are the photographs? Then, it would be difficult to know the difference between metal wheel or pipeline pieces, and a strela ceiling ring, given the damage in the wheel bay, and the decimated states the pieces of metal would be in? Remember they would also not know specifically what to look for. We can only assume that the photographic evidence is lost, and that the actual physical evidence long destroyed. So we have to look at the possibility that this was indeed part of a cover-up. Certainly if one does not want to be found out, destroying the evidence, not writing up any air crash reports and calling both accounts as Strela strikes, before the evidence has even been assessed would fit the actions of a cover-up. For the theory of sabotage to have any substance one has to consider motives. There were two motives that stood out. The first was the internal agreement with Joshua and Como. Ian Smith had sought out an internal deal with moderate African leaders, while not ideal it was a launching base. The British, under successive governments had clearly chosen Robert Mugabe as the legitimate front contender for the role of new Prime Minister. The British and their duplicity were well known. Nkomo was regarded by them as a buffoon, but essential to impose their Mugabe. Between them they represented all the terrorist forces. Nkomo forces were formidable, well-trained and reasonably disciplined. So when Ian Smith announced mere days before the first Viscount tragedy that he had nearly finalized a secret deal with Nkomo to bring him into the internal agreement, a number of people were caught out. The initial election was going to be in October 1978. So not only were they going to lose a substantial force but also were imposed a deadline. They had to act fast to offside Nkomo with Ian Smith and the Rhodesian people. They also had to ensure he stayed within the patriotic front and aligned with Mugabe. If his forces joined the Rhodesian effort Mugabe had no chance and his forces would have been wiped off the face of Africa. The internal agreement couldn't happen. 
so the powers that be plotted the Viscount sabotage. It was a very clever move. The second motive was that they knew Nkomo wouldn't accept Mugabe after they had taken over Rhodesia. So by creating a pariah out of Nkomo, they knew that the Rhodesians would decimate Nkomo's forces, to a point where they wouldn't be able to pose any real threat to Mugabe post-independence. It was killing two birds with one stone. So what happened that caused the second Viscount tragedy? Again the internal agreement elections had been postponed to March 1979. The Rhodesians had not yet gone in to decimate Nkomo's forces. And so the second part of their plans remained unaccomplished. With internal help they had managed to cover up their dirty deeds and so repeated the sabotage. The Viscounts had inexplicably not yet been Strela modified so they could get away with sabotage again. There was a bonus reason for the second incident and that was to get General Walls. He however, as we all know took a later flight. So in conclusion, we have established very strong motives, identified sabotage locations on the aircraft, refuted the forensic evidence, provided evidence and ways that the supposed concrete evidence was used, provided reasons for no air crash reports, technically and scientifically shown that it is near impossible for a Strela to have been used. We have also shown that statistically it is impossible to shoot down Viscounts twice. We have shown evidence that it was not how terrorists operated. We however leave the final conclusion to the viewer, you are the judge and jury. Whichever way you decide you will have learnt about the Strela and the myths that surround the weapon. Thank you for watching. In conclusion the revered Reverend de Acosta's sermon says it all. How the Western world turned its back on a heinous crime. In the name of God Most High, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, Amen. Clergymen, I am frequently told, should keep out of politics. And I thoroughly agree. For this reason, I will not allow politics to be preached in this cathedral. Clergy have to be reconcilers, and that is no easy job. A minister of religion with well-known political views who allows them to come to the fore, cannot reconcile, but will alienate others and fail in the chief part of his ministry. For this reason, I personally, and I emphasize I personally, am surprised at there being two members of the Executive Council who are clergymen. And it is my sincere prayer that they can act as Christ's ambassadors of reconciliation. My own ministry, began in Ghana, where Kwame Nkrumah preached, Seek ye first the political kingdom, and all these things will be added to you. We know what became of Kwame Nkrumah. We are not here to preach a political kingdom. We are here to preach the kingdom of God. Clergy are usually in the middle, shot at from both sides, and it is not an enviable role. Yet, times come when it is necessary to speak out and in direct and forthright terms, like trumpets with unmistakable notes. And I believe that this is one such time. Nobody who holds sacred the dignity of human life can be anything but sickened at the events attending the crash of the Viscount Hunyani. Survivors have the greatest call on the sympathy and assistance of every other human being. The horror of the crash was bad enough, but that this should have been compounded by murder of the most savage and treacherous sort leaves us stunned with disbelief and brings revulsion in the minds of anyone deserving the name human. This bestiality, worse than anything in recent history, stinks in the nostrils of heaven. But are we deafened with a voice of protest from nations who call themselves civilized? We are not. Like men in the story of the Good Samaritan, they pass by on the other side. One listens for loud condemnation by Dr. David Owen, himself a medical doctor trained to extend mercy and help to all in need. One listens and the silence is deafening. 
One listens for loud condemnation by the President of the United States of America, himself a man from the Bible Baptist belt, and again the silence is deafening. One listens for loud condemnation by the Pope, by the Chief Rabbi, by the Archbishop of Canterbury, by all who love the name of God, and again the silence is deafening. I do not believe in white supremacy, I do not believe in black supremacy either. I do not believe that anyone is better than another until he has proved himself to be so. And I believe that those who govern or who seek to govern must prove themselves worthy of the trust that will be placed in them. One looks for real leadership. One finds little in the Western world, how much less in Africa. So who is to be blamed for this ghastly episode? Like Pontius Pilate, the world may ask, what is truth? What is to be believed? That depends upon what your prejudices will allow you to believe. For then no evidence, even eyewitness evidence, will convince you otherwise. So who is to be blamed? First, those who fired the guns. Who were they? Youths and men who, as likely as not, were until recently in church schools. And that is the first terrible fact. Men who went over to the other side in a few months have been so indoctrinated that all that they have previously learned has been obliterated. How could this happen? if they had been given a truly Christian education. Secondly, it is common knowledge that in large parts of the world, violence is paraded on cinema and television screens as entertainment. Films about war, murder, violence, rape, devil possession and the like are good box office. Peak viewing time is set aside for murderers from Belfast, from Palestine, Europe, Africa and the rest to speak before audiences of tens of millions. Thugs are given the full treatment as if deserving and respect, but not so their victims' relations. Who else is to be blamed? I am sure that the United Nations and their church equivalent, the World Council of Churches, both bear blame in this. Each parades a pseudo-morality, which like all half-truths, is more dangerous than the lie direct. And from the safety and comfort of New York and Geneva, high moral attitudes can safely be struck. For us, in the sweat, the blood, the suffering, it is somewhat different. And who else bears the blame? The churches? Oh yes, I fear so. For too long, too many people have been allowed to call themselves believers when in fact they have been nothing of the kind, for those who believe must act. If you believe the car is going to crash, you attempt to get out. If you believe the house is on fire, you try to get help and move things quickly. If you believe that a child has drunk poison, you rush him to the doctor. Belief must bring action. And if you believe in God, you must do something about it. And yet churches, even in our own dangerous time, are more than half empty all the time. We are surrounded by the respectable who really equate belief in God with the Western way of life. In many war areas, Africans are being told to burn their Bibles. If the same call was made to us, what sort of Bibles would be handed in? Would they be dog-eared from constant use, well-thumbed and marked, or would they be pristine in their virgin loveliness in the same box in which they were first received? There are tens of millions of all races who call themselves believers, who never enter any house of prayer and praise, and many are folk who scream loudest against communism yet who do not themselves help to defeat these satanic forces by means of prayer and praise and religious witness. Or make no mistake, if our witness was as it ought to be, 
men would flock to join our ranks. As it is, we are bypassed by the world as if irrelevant. Is anyone else to be blamed for this ghastly episode near Kariba? I think so. Politicians throughout the world have made opportunist speeches from time to time, and these add to the heap of blameworthiness for a speech can cause wounds which may take years to heal. The ghastliness of this ill-fated flight from Kariba will be burned upon our memories for years to come. For others, far from our borders, it is an intellectual matter, not one which affects them deeply. And here is the tragedy. The especial danger of Marxism is its teaching that human life is cheap, expendable, and of less importance than the well-being of the state. But there are men who call themselves Christians, who have the same contempt of other human beings, and who treat them as being expendable. Had we, who claim to love God, shown more real and love and understanding in the past, more patience, more trust of others, the churches would not be vilified as they are today. To you, dear people, in the front of this great cathedral church, I have nothing but sympathy, and we share your grief. I have nothing but revulsion for the less than human act of murder which has so horrified us all. I have nothing but amazement at the silence of so many of the political leaders of the world. And I have nothing but sadness that our churches have failed so badly in the past to practice what we preach. May God forgive us all and may he bring all those who died so suddenly and unprepared into the light of his glorious presence. Amen.